Hello, everybody. It's time for Gaining Experience. My name's Corey Redloff, the truly evil one. And uh, in this show, uh, Gaining Experience, we talk about role-playing games with my co-host right over there, the RPG himself, role-playing guru, that is, Howard. Hello, all. Nice to see you again, even though I can't see you. <laughs> or can I? <laughs> so what is Gaining Experience? Gaining Experience is a live show. We do this live so we can talk to... Uh, people out there who want to help uh, help themselves get better at role-playing games. We aren't, like, we're, we've been doing this for a long, long time. Um, how many years between us did you figure out, Howard? Uh, I know I don't have that, like, in front of me. I had a calculator and all that, but it, it, was, it was a lot. Let's yeah, I think between, <laughs> between the two of us, I'm sure it's 120 years. That sounds completely logical. Yes, that's that's it what was, I'm going with until we get a hard number was, again. It was first they invented the wheel, then the wall, which is almost as old as the wheel, and then role play, and we were doing that. Yes, the wall <laughs> and the wheel. Um, so we, we try to get better at role playing games uh, as we have a discussion. So if you have a comment, if you have a question, something uh, you're doing in a role playing game that you need a question for, or if you would like to expand on a, a subject we're talking about, that's great. Uh, put it in the comments. If you're watching this live, we can discuss it live. If you're seeing this as a, um, uh, a recorded video, just put it in the comments and we will definitely uh, talk about it in the next episode. So, um, today's episode is about... So, yeah, we're talking about uh, adding drama to your game. If you've seen games online, you're like, wow, those guys, they really get into their character. They act it out. I can't wait to play. Then you play the game, and the people around your table are just moving their pieces and then making their shots, and then it's next guy's turn, and you're playing miniature combat, and you feel like you didn't get what you thought you were going to get. We're going to talk about how to make how to make game RP again, how to add some drama. That's right. Before we do that, uh, we like to get a little loose here, get our juices, our creative juices flowing with a little game I call, I did not see that coming. Do 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 in my beautiful graphic. If you think I should make a new graphic, put it in the comments below and we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, how this game works is one person will say a RPG plot hook and the other person will try and put a twist on it, something that makes it even more interesting than normal. And I'll go first. Um, my, my plot, it can be fantasy, but I'm going to say it's science fiction. Um, I'm inspired by Numenera for this plot line. And the plot is a village is sitting around a crystal. It, uh, it's well it's around a crystal the village sprout out around this crystal that every year creates supplies for this village that lasts the village an entire year this year the crystal has failed to pulse and create the supplies and the pcs are hired to find out what's gone wrong with the crystal all right um you said it's a sci-fi plot all yes right, so these these uh these people look around and they they see that the crystal's not working the, the village elders have been like hey you know you're the guys figure it out because we're hungry so the pcs step forward and they leave the village for the first time which no one has done and they find out that their village is inside of a giant case and whoever has been feeding them through that crystal is no longer coming by their case. They are inside of a very large starship. <laughs> or even better, the entire village has been miniaturized and inside like a like a like a gerbil cage. <laughs> and there's Brainiac with his little miniaturization ray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the bottled right. city of Candor. <laughs> All right. Um, do you want to do another one? Want me to go first? Yeah, or go ahead. Say, not, not first, obviously. All right, uh, going back to the fantasy themes and D&D and such. You, uh, your party has uh, 
just recently saved the city from the attacking uh, goblins. And you are being awarded uh, your little medals of honor. You are the heroes of Bluest, because Greenest is from another game. And here you have Save the City. Everyone is, is praising the heroes when these people come forward and they are, they are upset because it turns out that the goblins that you have just defeated were actually the neighboring town and a spell was cast making you see goblins when it was really just regular people that you have been fighting. Uh, now, these people want reparations for your attack on what should have been your neighbors. Wow. That's, that's already a twist in there. Okay. Now, I guess I'm not gone too far, but let's see where you think. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, the neighboring town was made to look like a goblin village, and these guys want reparations. Well, the the easiest twist would be that th that they were actually goblins all along. Yeah, there's there's a, a simple solution, and yet, but. But it's let's so go. Weird. Let's go even further than that. These people who want reparations for the Goblin Village are actually the evil people who made them look like goblins in the first place. In and they did it for a ransom, and now they're not getting paid and are pissed at the PCs <laughs> <laughs> and are trying to extort them for reparations for killing the town, hoping to prey off their uh, guilt. There you go. And remember, the point of these games is just to help uh, future DMs or current DMs just look at whatever situation you're currently running with and take a step back and go, all right, I see where I was already going, but what if I look at this with fresh eyes? What could I do differently? And would it be better or different or more fun for the players? If you want more plot ideas, I have been posting a, uh, a plot hook every day on my Facebook and Twitter feed. So if you go to at truly evil Bob on either of those, you can see a, a, a whole list of different plot hooks. Absolutely. Give him your money if you can afford it because he works really hard and he has a lot of great <laughs> oh, ideas. Yeah. I also have an adventure that I wrote. Yeah. Look in the, the description and there is, um, and you can buy an adventure called the sunken fortress, but oh, the, the Twitter forgotten fortress. <laughs> the the Twitter the Twitter is free. You can just grab all of these plot hooks right from my Twitter. What free? You madman! I know. <laughs> I'm crazy. <laughs> so let's well, get to take our main, advantage of him. <laughs> let's let's get to our main topic, which is adding drama to games. Now, before we get into this, I I'd like to point out that we do a gaming live stream here on the channel called Dead Unicorn, and last game. We could have benefited, I could have benefited from tips on how to add drama into a game. <laughs> because we did kind of a board gamey thing where the, the a ship, we did a, a long ship encounter. And I followed the rules that were in the book. And they were a bit lacking in a lot of ways. Mechanically, those rules made perfect sense. I have no issue with the mechanics. But when you get too into the mechanics, you're playing a, a combat tactical strategy game and you're just moving pieces on a board and if i want to play board games well then i'm not i'm here for the wrong reason i feel you know? like i feel like if the voyage was only for a day or two like if we were going around the the minerathad island islands just those those islands up there then those rules would have been great but since it was such a extended long sea voyage you get kind yeah. of yeah Exactly, exactly. And and uh, to your credit, it was your first time doing that long of a voyage, and it was the first time doing any of, any ship voyaging in 5th edition for us, so we didn't know until we got into it what it was going to be like, and then it was sort of a, ooh, oh, this is Dragon. <laughs> so, uh, let's get into your tips on making games more dramatic. All right, so there are two sides to the game. Um, one side is uh, the Dungeon Master, obviously, 
And my first thought is, as a dungeon master, how do I make my game engage my players? How do I make them want to role play rather than worry about, well, if I take a dip into fighter for my next level, I'm going to get the following bonuses to my, you know, whatever, or what armors I can wear. That's boring to me. I, I don't want to do miniature combat. I want to play the game. So first of all, as a dungeon master, always prepare for the game. Think of your plots and what kind of a setting you're going to be in. Arrange your settings before you get there. Because if you get there and you're not ready, I mean, you might be great at improvising. Everybody has their own style. But if you have nothing and you get there and your mind freezes, you're kind of screwed. And it becomes a game of, hey, here's a flip, 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 flip group of gnolls that are attacking you. Because according to this, they have an evil god that tells them to do that. So there you go. And that's boring. Uh, not that gnolls aren't interesting, their evil god isn't interesting, but if that's all you got, you know, it's not enough. So, so well, that, that just goes into random encounters. Like many random encounters are just that. You make a roll, you go, this is what I'm going to use, and you kind of put it in the best you can. For example, um, the, the dragon that landed on your ship uh, two episodes back in the Dead Unicorn was simply bronze. a random encounter. Uh, the bronze dragon. I, uh, his name was... Sounded like Bunyan. Banyan, uh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, so you added a personality to him. You gave him uh, a goal, which even if it was just curiosity, he satisfied it. He met us, found out where we were from, where we were going chose not to murder us all, and we all appreciated the heck out of that. And that was a good random encounter. Now, it, what I'm saying is, you already had your setting. You already knew what the basic plot, of the plot was before the random encounter came up. And that's exactly what I'm saying. If you have prepared, even if you don't have anything specifically prepared for the long voyage, you know they're on the boat. You've already given them the boat. You've given them the direction to go. They know why they're going. And then you're like, well, let's spice up the voyage. Let me go to my sneaky random encounter chart and throw that in there. You have enough background information that you don't have to work too hard to make this feel like it was always a part of the story. And for all we know, that dragon is now a part of the story. Maybe you have four or more encounters with that thing planned. Or maybe later on when you get bored, you're like, uh, I need to spice this up. Hey, where's that dragon? Let's put him here. And just, that is something you can totally do, but all of this requires you to prep work, you know, have the setting, have a goal for your party, and make sure you know what they're up to. And that was that goes to my next thing. Each player has created a character, and on it are the flaw, the ideal, the personality trait, and most importantly, the bond. It doesn't seem like it'd be most important, but it's the one that's not about them to role play. It's about you to bring up. If my bond is I wish to become powerful enough to go rescue my family who was taken from me, for, from me, or if my bond is I wish to become a great warrior so that I can better protect my people, my village, or if my bond is I would like to end slavery because the oppression, you know, be oppressed. Well, then as the dungeon master, you look at the character that I've just described and say, all right, well, I could make someone who knows their family show up. And that makes you go, oh, hey, then I want to protect my family. This guy knows my family. Maybe he has news that my family's in danger that gets me more involved in the plot. Or maybe he is in danger. He's an old family friend. Or maybe it's a member of my family who's in danger. Uh, same with the village thing. And if, it's, if I have a thing against slavery, show a guy with some slaves. So I am like, oh, that guy, that guy's got to go. And if you make him one of your big bads, or at least a minion of your big bad, then I am engaged in going after your plot because I have a personal vendetta now against your big bad evil guy, which is BBEG is a big common uh, acronym that this, they use. This is why a lot of people like um, a lot of game masters like uh, people to give them written histories and that that can be kind of a double-edged sword though you could get like thick big histories and you never read them because they're so big I would say um, hey if you're gonna give me a history 
two or three paragraphs is, is, is tops. Just hit the marks. Just give me the broad strokes. And yeah, if you give me that, I will attempt to put them into a game as much as possible. Um, and it, it's very important. Like family is, is such an in. And when somebody doesn't give me a, a, a history, I will start putting stuff like I'll just start making up their history and put stuff in there. I'm like your mom is in town. What? What? Huh? But how do you know my mom? I never wrote that down. Exactly. You didn't write it down. That's my job. Now. <laughs> and <laughs> as long as your players are great with that, you are all good. If they, there has to be a certain amount of trust between the dungeon master and the players. Otherwise uh, you end up in a situation where the dungeon master just keeps making up people uh, and you're like, ugh, now I have to lose my third cousin? Uh, what is the deal with you, dude? Oh, I just like killing off your family members to keep you involved in the plot. That becomes weird. So, you know, you do have to temper that a bit. And uh, Corey does. Don't misunderstand. Uh, he's a good dungeon master. I'm just saying. In general, I don't kill do anybody's to... family. <laughs> Though I will put yeah, them uh, in mortal danger. I, I had to think about it. I was like, I know. I, it's, yeah, it's danger, I guess. You don't normally kill them off. I have had the reverse, though. I've had a, a, a storyteller, because uh, it's a vampire game, uh, a storyteller who uh, would ask you about your character, and if you made the mistake of naming that you had any family member at all, the game would start with that person slaughtered to get you involved in the game. I had a character who literally was an elderly, uh, not elderly, but old vampire. He'd been around for a couple hundred years, so he didn't really have any mortal family. He had a dog. And so the game began with my neighbors poisoned my dog. <laughs> I was like, Seriously? You're murdering the dog? <laughs> Thanks, Sean. If you ever watch this, that's on you, sir. That's on you. <laughs> so how do you get um, more quiet people to to role play and not, you know? All right. There's there's that actually. No, There's sorry, actually good. two kinds of people who, who don't role play very often. And that's either they're quiet and they kind of sit back and they don't want to get involved or they're like really crunchy rules people. And okay. you know, Oh, this is a role play scene or this is a puzzle. Just y'all can take care of this. Tell me when, wait me when combat starts. So I have three kind of solutions for that. Uh, the first one I already went into, which is look at their character find their bond, the thing that they're supposed to be, they, they, they put on their own character saying they wanted to jump into combat for this. You know, this is the thing that gets me wanting to chase your plot, uh, whether it be my family, my long lost girlfriend that I've been searching for, I want to liberate slaves, whatever your bond is. Um, bring that in, that's number one, because uh, that directly targets their character and helps to pull them in. Uh, another one is, uh, and this is a big one, don't be afraid, don't be worried about embarrassing yourself because everybody at your table is playing Dungeons and Dragons to begin with. So two voices really go into the description of the world around to help immerse all of your players and that will help them to get more into the role play aspects of it. Um, when you describe uh, a, a NPC at a shop who is selling them things, you can just say the shopkeeper lets you buy whatever you want from the player's handbook. There's this whole list here. If you see it, it's that price, you're done. Or you can say, you see an older woman. She seems very wise, although not particularly pretty. And uh, she judges you and looks at the size of your pouches as you walk in. And then uh, you can have that player's handbook open in front of you. And when they ask about any particular item, glance at the item real quick and just slightly mark off, mark up the price. Yeah, that sword's going to be 15. Hey, the, the player's handbook says 10. Maybe they won't notice. Maybe they do. And if they do notice, let them role play that out. It just, uh, it makes the game more immersive and it helps draw people in. And my third, and this seems almost counterintuitive, but my third bit of advice after you have done your voices and done all your description, made the world immersive, is don't push too hard. If you have a player who does, who is enjoying the game, who is not complaining, but is not actively engaging in role-playing a flamboyant, you know, musketeer or whatever, not swinging from chandeliers and killing the bad guys, it's entirely possible you have a player who is enjoying the company, and your pressure could turn them off and make them leave. 
So give them time. Uh, I'm not saying don't try to engage them. Absolutely try, but don't push too hard or you're going to make them retreat and possibly leave your game altogether or just never engage. So you have to also be patient. That's my third bit of advice from the semester side. So on the shops, um, there's a good example in my last, uh, in, in the last episode of, of the Isle of Dread, Dead Unicorn, with uh, Thelford and Sons. That's, that just makes me laugh because if you watch that particular stream, um, every time he said it, he accidentally said Phil Drid, which is literally my character's name. Yes. And it's confusing to me because I'm like, I don't have a shop or sons. <laughs> um, and then, then from there, we also made the Sanford and Son jokes. And, so, and I personally was humming the tune from the old show. <laughs> sorry, but um, yeah, I, I try to make that shop really come alive and really feel like something that was real in the world that uh, yeah, the, our, the PCs had to think around this problem of how to buy stuff from Felford and Sons because you couldn't actually just walk in and buy stuff. It was, it was interesting. And uh, I wasn't, I was only tangentially related to that particular uh, aspect of the plot. Uh, so it didn't affect me in general. I think I would handle it differently. But I do like that the, the player was like, um, you know what? One of the other players in this game, I know she does stuff like this. I'm going to go to her. And he did a good job of trying to engage a fellow player, you know, bring her into the scene. So I, I you know, a little praise to you, Terry, if you ever watch this. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and I actually had to, to make that shop. I, I knew somebody was wanting to do find a magical item shop from the last episode. And so for the new episode, I did a little research on the town they were in and the government. And I saw that magical items are very restricted and even casting magic was very restricted. So I came up with this, this shop idea out of that. I liked it. All right. So from the player side, let's move on to the player side. Um, how do you make your game better? How do you get your friends to get more involved? And uh, to a degree, sometimes you will have dungeon masters that aren't as into this as you are, and you want to try and nudge them to be a little bit more RP into it also. So first of all, while making your character, because this is the very beginning of every campaign, everybody makes a character, don't make an edgelord. Don't make the guy who is, I am the knight, and I murder everyone that comes to me. All of my family are dead, and I am out to avenge them. And I have all the powers, and I can't be stopped. Okay, well, you sound like you'd make a fascinating, fascinating solo movie, maybe, or a terrible one. But at the same time, you're making a party member. You need to make a guy who wants to accomplish things. You have goals, but you don't make goals that you can completely accomplish all of them by yourself. Because there, then there's no point for you to ever get with that cleric and that wizard and that rogue over there because you got this and that's not how the game works this game is cooperative place so don't be a total edge lord you want to make somebody who can fill a role within a group you can have goals and absolutely try and get just like Tarek did last game try and get your party members to come help you with those goals and more often than not they will because that's the point of the game is cooperative play and it Make great stories as you all come together to help the one PC who wants to liberate his love, who is a slave, and you know, but of the drow or whatever. So don't don't be an edge lord. Make a party member. That's number one. Second, your second don't don't know it all. The moment you see a bugbear for the first time, don't go. Oh well, that's a bugbear. I know because I have been playing D and D for a million years. Yeah, you know what a bugbear is. I know what a bugbear is. They, they're giant hairy goblin monsters. But the first time you see one, and I say you see a seven foot tall furry creature with like huge jowls and tusks and arms that are just ridiculously long to come down like eat light. And he almost looks like knuckle dragon while he walks, just boom, boom. And he reaches behind him, he pulls forth this huge axe and he brings it towards you. 
and he you think he can reach you from almost 10 feet away well that is a bugbear but you've never seen this before make a character who is not the most worldly so you can role play being surprised you can role play being horrified and going ah what is this horrible neanderthal dork ah run it's hideous and when you role play it and don't do everything, it gives you more to talk about as you and your friends try to figure it out. Yeah, out of character, sounds like a bugbear. In character, why do you need to know? You're still going to fight it. You're still going to use pretty much the same tactics. So don't be a know-it-all and enjoy the surprise. Um, here's another one. Make bad choices. Don't always do the thing that is most logical because you know how Forgotten Realms works or the world works based on who has what spell components, etc. Occasionally, leap at a guy that you know you shouldn't leap at yet because, well, my rogue is here and he would have surprise if I just wait. If you don't know that, take your leap. You two can work that out later. It will be a growing experience. And next combat, you'll go, hey, I'm going to hold this time, and I, I eyeball the rogue, and the rogue gives you that no and wink, and then he gets his shot, and the game becomes even more immersive and fun. So don't, don't know it all. Make some bad choices. Definitely don't be an edgelord. Those are the don'ts uh, for, the, for the stuff you do want to do. And I, I'm sorry, Corey. Am I, am I talking too much? No, story? no. Uh, please, okay. go on. I really liked your idea, though, of, of um, bringing other people in if you're a player and you need something done, I remember one time I was playing in a group of uh, relatively new gamers and I suddenly turned to another player and I was like, hey, could you help me out with this? I don't have this expertise. And they looked at me like, wait, what? Like it was a new novel thing to ask another <laughs> player for help. <laughs> it, it's great. I love it when that occurs. Uh, all right. So the next thing I want to say is Look at look at your sheet like it's not a pile of numbers. Uh, and I think I, I might have touched on this earlier, but when you're talking about like leveling up, if your character is a true believer. Whoa. Well, I don't know what happened to Howard. Um, we'll get him back as soon as possible, everybody. Uh <laughs> Woo. Um what do I do to get them back? Wait. No. He suddenly left. I got to fill this empty time somehow. <laughs> well, um, you know what? We're going to end the episode a little early. Uh, it's time for, for the end of the episode anyways. I want to thank everybody for watching. Uh, please support the channel. Um, watch this every Wednesday night at uh, 6, 6 o'clock at Pacific Time. And watch our other shows. Dead Unicorns on Tuesday. Cyber Samurai is on Saturday. And I am coming up with new, new stuff all the time. And uh, new things should be coming down the pipeline very soon. Um, check out my adventure uh, the Sunken Fortress, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching, everybody.